Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jumma Mubarak to you all. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu, nasta'inuhu, nasta'ufiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyata amalina. Man yadihillahu falamudillala. Wa man yudlilhu falahadiyala. Wa ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All praise is due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from those of our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray. Whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship. No God except Allah who is the one and has no partner. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad is Allah's true servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful and aware of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu Allah wa qulu qawlan sadeedah yuslih lakum a'amalakum wa yaghfir lakum dunubakum wa man yuta illaha wa rasooluhu faqad faza fawzan azimah O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah and say that which is right. Speak the truth. Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive you of your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph. I pray that may Allah open my chest, make easy for me this task, and loosens the knots of my tongue that these words may be understood. And glory be to you, Allah. Glory be to you alone that we have no knowledge except that which you have taught us. Verily, it is you who is the all knowing and the all wise. Again, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. It's a blessing again to be here with you all, to be here with respect to a topic uh, that is chosen that really speaks to and is relevant to each and every one of us. None of us are exempt from this, um, this aspect of bad habits and breaking bad habits, but also this aspect of mindfulness. So bad habits in, in our society, in our day and age, and for us as humans are very easy to form. They are not that hard to find, uh, whether it is watching too much TV or spending too much time on social media or just using certain substances or using too many substances, you know, lying, backbiting, gossiping, or, you know, some more mundane things that we might not necessarily think of as bad habits. And, and you know, we haven't uh, associated them as such, but maybe overeating, maybe not sleeping enough, or maybe just being uh, at bedtime scrolling through our phone endlessly. And, you know, all these different things, all these different kinds of habits that we are all susceptible to, you know, bad habits don't necessarily just come in a with a bright red warning label that that says, you know, beware, or like, you know, just uh, stop or halt before anything comes up. Uh, they, they usually will maybe be a lot of times, some of them may be very good habits at their root. They may be good habits that have just now gone too far or gone past that level of moderation and now have become uh, more of a central focus and, and kind of like an addiction almost in a sense. They, they take us away from the things that truly give us meaning. They take us away from things that enable us to grow. They take us away from things that at the end of the day may enable us to be connected uh, more so to our creator, to Allah. So they don't necessarily have to be bad at their root, but becoming a bad habit in a sense that they become they come to a level in which they take away from that which is truly beneficial from us and 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 they start to hinder us in different ways that we may not see or recognize and it may not just be that we in forming this bad habit we're just affected one way that oh hey you know we uh, we're just because we're eating a lot and we're doing all this stuff or we're not sleeping enough and we're not seeing any somatic effects to it we don't see any physical effects to our body doesn't mean it's not a, a bad habit. It doesn't mean it's having effects on us in our spiritual uh, spells and our spiritual bodies or in our uh, to our emotional selves, to our uh, mental and psychological faculties. It doesn't mean that those things are being uh, left unaffected, even if our uh, physical fat is our, our physical body is not is being affected. So thinking about that, all of these different habits, they have these kinds of impacts, but for us at this time and point in breaking those habits in trying to get past them and trying to move past this, 
what does mindfulness have to do with them? What, what, does, what does having this aspect of being mindful have to do with breaking uh, bad habits? So there's a TED Talk that actually centers on this topic, on mindfulness and breaking bad habits by Dr. Judson Brewer, Dr. Judd, um, on this element of mindfulness and curiosity in being essential to breaking bad habits. Um, Dr. Brewer talks about how bad habits form out of, uh, they, they, you know, we, we start to do these things to combat negative feelings or emotions. You know, we may have uh, something that is a stressor in our life, and we then take on a habit because it may feel good in that moment. And we start to take on that habit, but uh, eventually maybe becoming addicted to it. We, it becomes our primary kind of coping mechanism because it, it's just a, it, it's a misassociation of this aspect of reward, this aspect of um, us getting something out of a particular uh, thing that we're doing. And now our brain is associating it as, oh, when you are stressed or when you're going through some difficulty, this is what you need to do, whether that is uh, overeating on some foods, whether that is smoking cigarettes, or whether it is, you know, yelling at other people and getting angry with other people, all these different things they, they, that can become addicted, uh, that we can become addicted in a sense. And Dr. Judd proposes a very interesting way of looking at things, that, that in, in combating these kinds of habits, oftentimes societally or just in terms of how we may see it from the outside, we're like, why don't you just stop cold turkey? Why don't you just, you know, um, you know, just uh, go ahead and quit it and and just, you know, it's a testament to your resolve. It's a testament to your strength if you're able to do so. If you're not, you're weak, and so on and so forth. However, in his uh, in his lab and his study and his talk, Dr. Dell was talking about that, you know, in this aspect of becoming curious rather than just telling people that no, um, you know, we're going to go ahead and uh, you know, just hold you back from these, uh, these bad things, whether it's cigarettes or whatnot, um, that instead, there's this element of becoming curious about that experience, uh, becoming curious about what it is you're actually doing, that could actually affect whether or not you choose to continue to do it and actually then quit the bad habit that you're doing. And so his lab studied whether mindfulness training could help people quit smoking. And you know, as he, as I mentioned that, you know, you could try and force people to put them uh, quit smoking, you know, they can try and push that on them. And he mentioned that, you know, majority of the folks who had tried, uh, had come into his, his lab had tried that and they failed almost on average of six times. And that mindfulness in, in the context of his study, they dropped the forcing. They didn't say that you have to now drop the cigarettes. And we're going to just center this aspect of mindfulness. They actually said that you can continue to smoke just when you do smoke, be curious about what and mindful of what it is like when you do smoke. What when you take that hit of that cigarette, when you inhale it, when you taste it, when you uh, are spending time with that cigarette, be mindful of it. Tell us what is it, what is it like? And he responded that people, when they did this kind of mindful smoking, responded that when they're when they are smoking, they noticed that the smoke smells terrible, the cigarette uh, tastes terrible that where they were, where they're sitting, it's just, it, it doesn't feel good, that this whole aspect, they, they, they knew smoking was bad for them. They knew this habit was bad cognitively, objectively, but the aspect of actually taking it in, they, they were able to, they, it kind of overrode that in their, in their system when they would just, you know, uh, respond to a stressor or to a difficult thing by taking in the substance. And so they moved from, as Dr. Judd says, from knowledge to wisdom when they recognized that actually this isn't, this isn't that good. So they started to become disenchanted when they realized what it actually is that they're taking in, how they're, they're in touch with their body, they're in touch with how they're feeling, they're in touch with the environment when they take this thing in. And so he talks about, you know, when we're stressed, our cognitive function is the first thing to go and we fall onto our old habits and we do the things that we just feel like our mind has associated that will make us feel better. Um, but mindfulness actually helps us see things a little bit more clearly that we, we get when we get caught up in different behaviors, uh, we become uh, disenchanted um, and then naturally uh, letting go in a way that, that, that we uh, are caught up in these different things happening. But when we take that pause, we take that aspect to mindfully recognize what is actually that we're taking in and what, what it is that we're actually doing to actually sit with it. The aspect of then becoming disenchanted, the aspect of then naturally letting go, forming new habits, uh, allows us to then take place. This curiosity is, is what then substitutes this aspect of this dependence, of wanting to know what more, what better can I actually do? And so 
uh, at the end of his talk, he actually shared that his mindfulness training study, this aspect of mindfully combating smoking uh, in terms of uh, cessation and whatnot, that the mindfulness training study had twice as good of a result than gold standard therapy at helping people quit smoking. That uh, when people actually intentionally, um, you know, they would continue to smoke, but when they actually practice this mindfulness, their rate of quitting smoking was twice as much as that of people going through a standard therapy. And as, as mentioned, it may not just be smoking. Smoking may be the low hanging fruit here because it's easy for us to identify. It's easy for us to see and uh, smell and to taste. It has all these sens sensational kind of factors with it. But other habits, it invites us to think about that when we are curiously aware that what's happening in our mind and our body, that when we are doing those things on impulse, whether we are texting people like at rapid response, and we're addicted to like our devices, or um, we need to, uh, you know, just do whatever it is, uh, you know, in, in terms of these compulsions, having instead a chance to take a pause, to ask ourselves to uh, get curious about what is, what is it like for us here? What's our, what, what are we in touch with? Why are we uh, just compulsively responding to something like this? Why are we doing this behavior? Noticing that urge and then feeling a kind of a, a, a joy and sense of letting go um, this, this aspect of release because we will get maybe that instant gratification that our society has um, really accultured us to that. Oh, hey, I just bought something online. I'm just, I'm addicted to shopping. I'm just buying something. Oh, great. I just got this new thing. I'll never use it again. But we get that little bit of a sensation versus the pleasure that we get from genuinely letting go when we're like, wait a second, this actually isn't probably the best thing for me. And uh, it's probably not going to be the best thing for my bank account, but being able to mindfully sit with there. Uh, and, and, and to tie it as well, this aspect, what does it have to do with Islam? What does it have to do with this aspect of mindfulness and consciousness in, in, in our faith that when it comes to breaking bad habits, what did Dr. Judd's study, how does that relate to our, uh, our own deen? So we think about the centrality of mindfulness and consciousness and this aspect of thought in Islam. We see constantly in the Quran, uh, Allah is relating that afala do you, you know do you not use your wits afala do you do you not ponder you know afala uh, do, do you not see that is echoed so many times these invocations uh, amongst the people amongst the people whom the prophet is coming to to the people who previous prophets have come to um, and to humanity in general that when the signs of allah are here when different issues are coming about that you know will you not then use your reason, you know, that, that will you not then use this aspect of your intellect, your aql, will you not use this mind that we've given you, um, or this aspect of, you know, will you not understand the truth, will you not understand what might, what is being conveyed, um, but that what is given to you, what is presented here is presented so that you might think, that you might spend some time uh, and also, you know, as, as the Quran oftentimes says, for a people who think that there is for that we have uh, provided this for people who will ponder, who will reflect, who will think. So Islam is not a, a very superficial religion in that aspect. It's not a very instant gratification. Islam calls for us to be a people of mindfulness, to be a people who are conscious. And as we opened up this khutbah with that, uh, in, in, in the verses of the Quran, to be mindful of Allah, to, to be cognizant, to be aware of Allah, to be a people who are cognizant and aware of Allah. Um, because of the fact that just this, this element of mindfulness is not something that is divorced from our uh, practice as Muslims, that mindfulness and being mindful, not just in terms of theology, not just in terms of one thing or another, but to be holistically mindful, to be mindful of the environment that we're around, to be mindful of the relationships that we have, to be mindful of ourselves. Uh, this is all a part and parcel of our faith. And to think about in the context of Dr. Judd's study of uh, replacing a bad habit or combating a bad habit, breaking a bad habit with this element of mindfulness, a parallel is very strong, strong to be able to see in, in our faith and tradition of uh, the prohibition of alcohol and how alcohol was prohibited in Islam, how alcohol was forbidden in Islam, how it came to be prohibited uh, within our faith and how it played out within the life of the Prophet So in the Quran, you have this, uh, this element of you know, different verses that uh, are laid out as understood over the years that Islam gradually prohibited alcohol in certain ways over a period of 16 years. 
Now that's huge because you think about the enterprise of Islam or the, the whole mission of Islam, the message of Islam was 23 years. 16 of those years were years getting people off of alcohol, gradually taking it out. If Islam was you know, black and white in a way, it could have easily just said, hey, from the get-go, uh, alcohol is not our thing that's allowed, um, so get, get, get off of it. That's the very first thing. However, Islam recognized the, the human condition of dependence. Islam recognized how the psychology of addiction works. Islam recognized this and, and approached this aspect 1,400 years ago to this TED Talk of mindfulness with respect to breaking a bad habit. So when uh, Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah that in khamar, in wine, in alcohol, in these intoxicants, and in gambling, you know, in these things, there is great sin and there's some benefit. But the sin is greater than benefit. And Allah says uh, later in, 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 in the same passage that may, you, might, you might give it some thought. You might give these signs of Allah some thought that uh, these signs have been placed in here that لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَفَكَّرُونَ that you might give it some thought. You know, just thinking about that in, in this thing, there's great sin and there's also some benefit. There may, there's a lot of sin, there's some benefit, but the, the sin outweighs the benefit. And thinking about what does it mean in the context for these people who have become dependent on alcohol, who have become uh, so dependent that it has it it, it governs their uh, intellect, it governs their decision making, it hinders their decision making in a way. And so, thinking about they've become dependent on this, and in the first part of this 16-year project to wane this community off of alcohol, uh, the first aspect is to to be able to bring in that question: What what do they know of what sin is? Um, they're living in sin. So what 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 is what is this aspect of introducing sin to them? And, but acknowledging there may be some benefit, but the sin is greater than the benefit. And, and asking him, don't you think about it? Give it some thought. We're telling you about what else is kind of sinful. We're talking, we're teaching them what is sin. We're teaching them what is right, what is wrong. Um, and if there's greater sin in this than benefit, think about it. What, is, what does that mean? So giving a first plan in that sense. And then in Surah An-Nisa, you have the injunction to not go to a near prayer. Don't even come near Salah until you know what you are saying, that do not show up to prayer drunk, because it's hindering from what you are going to be talking about, what you're going to be saying, that when you show up for prayer, whether you're drunk or not, whether you drank or not, you should be aware of the words coming out of your mouth. And so to, to be mindful as well, to be mindful, not just of the existential aspect of sin and benefit and whatnot, but to now be in a space where you're not approaching the prayer in a state of intoxication, because you need to know what you're saying. You need to at least be present. You need to be mindful of that which is coming out of your mouth. So thinking about, again, gradually, what is this next step? It's, it's building that mindfulness of presence, building that mindfulness of uh, what the ritual is, what is salah, what is this whole thing that we're doing, uh, but what is the importance of uh, uttering the words that are being taught to you in salah? And then finally, you get to Surah Al-Ma'idah, where Allah says that intoxicants, gambling, all these different things, avoid it so that you might be successful that uh these these are these are uh you know workings of of shaitan that these are um from his handicraft uh and 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 that uh to avoid them to to leave them off so that you might be successful so that you might be uh, a people who achieve success and this might not just this isn't just limited to the worldly success uh, but to think about how allah says in surah al-mu'minun that qad aflaha mu'minun that uh, successful indeed are the believers that you think about what what is success in the Islamic context, but you also think about it in the context of our society that if you are someone who is caught up with things that are those intoxicants gambling or other things like that. Um, just think about all the different stories that you you probably see on uh, different media outlets and whatnot of how people's success uh, people who have achieved that worldly success it's all gone because it may be in, in a day or so uh, whether they had been drunk driving that that one night and they they uh you know hit somebody or they lost all their money gambling or whatnot thinking about there's maybe some benefit in these things but there's a greater sin and building this consciousness of these aspects and uh in in, in the same passage thinking about that these things avert from the remembrance of allah and will you not desist is what uh, uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah lifts up for us, that these are things that all, um, like intoxicants, the gambling, all these different things that are there, 
they avert from Allah's remembrance. Not only do they maybe hinder how you're showing up to prayer, but ultimately at their essence, they avert from the remembrance of Allah. And will you not desist now? You know that in them is greater sin than benefit. You know that uh, with respect to um, the prayer that you need to be, whether it's prayer or whether any ritual in Islam, you need to be aware of what you're saying and what you're doing. Um, and you know that these things are in, uh, the handicrafts of shaitan. These are not the uh, these are not beneficial things, um, and that they will avert avoid you from being successful. And if you do, and 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 ultimately they'll avo avert you from remembering Allah, from connecting to Allah, from achieving your true purpose as a human being to reconnect with Allah. And so, will you not desist after recognizing? these things. And so you have this element with respect to the uh, uh, with respect to alcohol that is stage by stage by stage. And we'll see inshallah how the Prophet dealt with this on a micro level. But in addition, just like you said, you know, the aspect of alcohol sometimes feels like the low hanging fruit or the forbidden substances and things like that. They sometimes for us feel like low hanging fruit, especially if maybe we grew up in a context that this was not so much of an issue. So we're already we're kind of, uh, you know, kind of separated from it there. But it's, it may not feel as real with respect to our experience for some of us. For others of us, it may be very much so that this is a ongoing struggle and as it was for the early Muslim community. But in another context, you have uh, an example in the Quran lifted up in Surah Al-Hujurat that avoiding this negative assumption, avoiding negative assumption or assuming things about people or spying or backbiting, and it invites the reader, invites the person who hears this would you like to eat the flesh of your dead brother? That the equivalence of uh, doing this backbiting, of spying, of doing these things that are negative in their nature and becoming, you, we see this now becoming uh, habituated in so many different ways where we, we become dependent on the gossip that we sometimes will hear or we, we, we are uh, really uh, attuned to wanting to talk, uh, do backbiting or any of these different things that give kind of that negative fuel but they it, it, it's like oh this like that's what the juicy comment is or so and so did this so and so did that um that it it feels good it, it it's all it, it has those different weird emotions that's coming with it but allah reminds us that before you even do that would you like to eat the flesh of your dead brother that in doing so that the equivalence of that the imagery that is in that space the 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 pause and 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 reminds the people what the Allah, that be mindful of allah be mindful of Allah in the state that which you return to Allah, because ultimately we come from Allah, but we return to Allah, and we're mindful of Allah in that we return in a state. Will we not return in a state of mindfulness that we were doing something that Allah had prohibited us? And and just thinking about in that element of whether it's alcohol, whether it's any other gambling, other things, um, gossip, backbiting, things that so many of us uh, can get caught up in. That at the at the least, do we not uh, recognize? that uh, these things take away from our connection with Allah, but also do we just take a moment to pause? What is, what is there truly of benefit in these things to offer? And does their sin outweigh their benefit? If so, what benefit do, are we really deriving from this apart from a short hit? Just like Dr. Judd had said that we can get a text message instantly from our phone. And as soon as we get that text message, we can respond and we're like, okay, good. It just gives an instant hit to us. But versus what, is it, what does it look like for us to then be able to see a message like that that's not an urgent thing and be able to be like, I don't need to, I'm not, I'm not chained to this device. I'm not, I'm not dependent upon it. I can respond to it at my own time. That aspect of letting go and the feeling that that gives you, the satisfaction that that gives you of completely outweighing that instant kind of hit and, and giving a whole sense of liberation and self-assurance. So thinking about what is the difference in, in that mindfulness and recognition? And lastly, thinking about what did our Prophet Sallallahu do in, in, in context of this, specifically with, with alcohol. We have the story of a man that would come to the masjid uh, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and he would come intoxicated. He would come with his bottle and he would be uh, intoxicated and he would probably, you know, bump into uh, the Sahaba. He would be, you know, praying, but he's praying in, while he's intoxicated. So, you know, there's all these different things coming up for him. And the companions now uh, now are protesting to the Prophet. So they're like, how's this person allowed to come to the masjid? He's coming in drunk. Do something about him. And the Prophet some could have very easily just said, hey, um, you know, we, 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 we don't want any alcohol near here. We prohibit this or whatnot. Don't come back until you're sober. Could have forced sobriety on him. And the Prophet some instead told this person that, why don't you just leave your bottle at the door of the masjid? Just, just leave it there. Um, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't shame him or anything. Didn't say, hey, you have to only be sober before you come in here. And naturally, you know, the person would 
leave his bottle at the door, but that's not going to do so much for sobriety. He's still going to get drunk uh, if he, even if he leaves his bottle there. So he's still in that state, and the companions keep coming to the prophet that, hey, he's still doing this. And the prophet repeats the process that, hey, why don't you just leave that bottle at the corner um, before you come to the mosque? Why don't you leave it at the market? Why don't you leave it there? Finally, why don't you just leave it at home? All right, just leave it at home, and then uh, you can just come to the mosque. And eventually the Prophet works with this person in this manner, not forcing this upon him, but gradually uh, working with him in the sense. And finally, that person comes back to prayer the next uh, iteration. And uh, the Prophet is, is, is talking with him. And he's like, I've left that bottle at home. I've left uh, the, the khamar. I've left alcohol. I've left drinking of that. And I, I don't need it anymore. And just thinking about what the Prophet do in this aspect of not just forcing this on him where he could have easily, you know, just been struggling his whole life now with respect to what is going on uh, in terms of uh, trying to pick between this alcohol that gives him an instant hit versus the religion and the community that is also fulfilling in, in its own way and having to choose between these two versus being tapered off of it in a way that he sees and he's mindful of what is really that which is important to him and thinking about uh, as well, that you have uh, in a similar kind of example, parallel, but a different scenario where you have a man, a famous example where a man comes up to the Prophet and asks him, give me permission to commit adultery or uh, give me permission to fornicate in a sense. And naturally people around him have a very you know, strong response. But thinking about this person's question, could this have been somebody that was already committing this and felt a, a strong degree of shame, a strong degree of uh, just like, oh, like, I don't know if I need, I, I, I can keep doing this. Let me just ask the prophet to give me permission. You know, it's a very in, uh, unusual thing to come and ask uh, the prophet for permission to do something like this. But it makes you think about what was this person like before? Uh, and what was it? And just wake up one day and say, hey, I want to commit adultery. Let me go ask the prophet to commit it. Maybe this might have been something that they were struggling with. Maybe this was something they had committed. Maybe this was something they were dealing with in a lot of shame. And the process doesn't just tell him like, what the heck is wrong with you? Like, you know, just that's not that's not what we do. Like, you know, stop thinking like that. That's that's weird. Don't do that. The process sits with him, sits with him, you know, man to man and says that, you know, would you would you want this for? And he lifts out all the different connections that uh, a, a man can have with respect to the relationships um, to a woman, with respect to a mother, sister, aunt, you know, all these different things, a daughter. And he asks him, mean, would you want that for your sister? Do you want that for your mom? Would you want that for your aunt or your daughter? And the man says, no, I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want that. Um, and finally, he, he gets the point. He's like, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't even want any of that. I, I will never even think about that. And the process, um, before he leaves, sits, uh, sits with him and puts his hand on his chest and prays for this person. And he prays for this person in, 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 in that, you know, this, this be somebody that uh, never goes near any of this kind of sin. But thinking about that later on in this person's life, that he was not somebody to go near that. Um, but just thinking about how the Prophet had, uh, had, had, had kind of walked him through to be that mindful, be mindful in, with respect to um, what you are, uh, what you're asking about, would you want it for somebody else? He's not, he's not shaming him. He's not putting him in a corner and saying, you know, uh, you, you need to know better than this. Like we've been, we, we obviously should have gotten that point across to you, but he invites that person to be curious. He invites curiosity as Dr. Joe was talking about curiosity helps uh, is, is beneficial for us. Curiosity is a positive thing. Curiosity is a good thing that we, we, we lean into as human beings. And so he invites that curiosity and he asks him, would you want that? And the, to the point where a person says, I don't want it. Uh, but he, he doesn't leave that person like, okay, hey, now, now get out of here um, and don't come back until you add a good have a good question or appropriate question. No, Prophet Sun puts his hand on his chest and connects with that man. And there's a, a, another talk that is by um, uh, Johan Hari uh, that talks about uh, how we view addiction, how we as society understand addiction. And he lifts up a very, very compelling point that rather than becoming addicting to something, there's a, there's a, there's this element of instead maybe becoming bonded to something. It, it could be, you know, anything from gambling to pornography to, um, you know, just a uh, addiction to our cell phones or devices or uh, substances or anything like that. Because our, our nature as human beings, that when we're beaten down by life, when we're tra tra traumatized, when we're isolated, when we're alone, um, not being able to bear with what's happening or, or just wanting to have a release and get away from it, that we, we bond with something because we feel that that's what is going to, uh, it may give us that, that initial hit, like uh, Dr. Judd had told us, that it, 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 you know, it's an odd kind of a association in our mind. But ultimately, it becomes something that is, is, is like this odd companion that just shows that, that we feel like we can only get 
um, you know, it's the only thing that understands us, the only release that we have. It's the only thing that we can um, bond with. And we truly do bond with that. And what, what perpetuates it, what exacerbates it is isolation. What exacerbates it is a lack of connection. However, if we, and he lifts up very powerfully that the opposite of addiction for him, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And this is in, inherently what Islam is about, that as the Prophet ﷺ had shown that whether it's bad habits, whether it's bad habits that we just do periodically, or whether it's a bad habit that becomes an addiction, that it is something that uh, is, is combated not just with this aspect of shame, not just with this aspect of um, putting someone in a corner and just saying, okay, now you need to just uh, cold turkey, break it here um, and, and, and have no compassion. The, the opposite actually is in the sense of having both mindfulness as well as this aspect of connection. So the man who was an alcoholic coming to the prophet's mosque, he was gradually tapered off this, but not in a way that was shaming him, in a way that was making him curious, mindful. Why do I have to leave my bottle at the door? Why do I have to leave it there? Why do I have to leave it there? But also what is happening to me? What is happening to me and what is the expense of it? I see people's behaviors are changing to me when I'm leaving that bottle further and further away, thinking about the curiosity that Islam invited them to, but then similarly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi connecting them to community, not isolating them, not saying don't come here until you're sober, connecting them with the community, showing them that there's something more beneficial than what this bottle or what this thing has to offer you. In the same sense for the man who wanted permission to commit adultery, that leaving that off, putting it to the side, like just, just go, you know, isolate and shame on you. Like, you know, how dare you even ask that question? And instead being able to invite mindfulness, curiosity, think about what, how would you feel if somebody said that to you about this or about that person or so-and-so that you loved? And then instead also at the end of that, not just being like, okay, now that you realized it, um, don't ever come back and ask that question until you are in a straight mind, but putting his hand and praying for this person, putting his hand and, and giving a, a dua for this person, but in the context of not isolation, he's around all the different companions. So connecting him with uh, and, and, and making him feel a part of a community and whatnot. So thinking about what uh, we have to do in terms of breaking our own habits, what we have to do in not just maybe breaking our own habits, but sometimes we may get frustrated with the habits we see our loved ones and people who are me, um, uh, near and dear to us form that sometimes it's not just us reprimanding them, reproaching them and whatnot. Sometimes it may be that we just need to, first and foremost, be mindful, we need to be aware of what, what it may be that's going on rather than showing them the firm, firm hand. Uh, we don't want to let a bad habit today for ourselves or for somebody else become a regret tomorrow or even on uh, our deathbeds. And you know when we are uh, engaged in our uh, in, in these different bad habits that we want to remember that before we reprimand, before we be harsh, before we rebuke, there might actually be a need. There might be a psychological need, an innate need, a cry for help that only compassion, consideration, and connection can help. So, you know, when we're engaged in unfulfilling habits, you know, we're, we're taking away from uh, that chance of being more engaged and more present in other things and not just ourselves, but it's, it's holistic, right? We, 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 we're, we're a community, we function together. But similarly, we want to lead like the Prophet ﷺ. We want to lead uh, like the Quran teaches us in understanding the human condition of what is uh, what 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 we can become susceptible to, but how we can heal is not necessarily just a black and white approach, but a very gray approach in terms of meeting people where they are. So, inshallah, as we close, we think about and we want to reflect as the Quran invokes us to to be a people of tafakkur, to be a people. Um, who reflect to be a people of aqal, to be a people who use our aqal. So as we go forward today, inshallah, look, look at ourselves uh, with respect to a habit that we might form, uh, a thing that we might be uh, cogn uh, co consciously or not consciously, subconsciously addicted to, that we become dependent to. And think about for a moment, just being mindful of it, being a people of tafakkur, being a people um, who use our intellect and reasoning, asking ourselves, is this, is this, how do we feel with this? What does this make us feel like? What does this taste like? What, what, is, what are all these different things? How does this fit in with us? And at the same time as well, thinking about how do I offset that? Going cold turkey may not be the strongest thing to, to do that. Um, am I connected with community? Am I connected with other people? What is my level of connection uh, to challenge ourselves in that way? And similarly, for those of us who may not be uh, struggling in the same way, 
to be aware of other people as the Prophet ﷺ was, that when we see something that is not pleasing, when we see something that is harming someone else, maybe it's not the firm hand that they need right now. Maybe it's not the reprimand or the rebuke, but maybe it is that compassion that they need, consideration, the uh, empathy that is there, and that essential connection. So may Allah enable us to be a wholesome community that regardless of our flaws, each of us has our own flaws, that we come together to build something and put something together that is stronger uh, than what we ever could uh, on our own. And may Allah enable us to be a people who not only are of people of reflection and deep thought, but people who can see, people who can hear, people who can think, people who can reflect and recognize, and ultimately whose hearts can be at peace knowing that uh, ultimately, what we want to be mindful of is Allah. And when we're mindful of Allah, we become mindful of the creation. And when we become mindful of the creation, we become mindful of ourselves. And in reverse order, that when we become mindful of ourselves, we become mindful of the people around us. When we become mindful of the people around us, we become mindful of the environment around us. When we are mindful of all of these things, we become mindful of Allah. So not divorcing that sense of mindfulness and to follow our Prophet Sallallahu model of and that teaching of not just in ritual of what Islam is, in that mindfulness and centeredness of what Islam can be, and in specific regards to breaking of the bad habits. So next time we have a bad habit that we are forming, thinking about um, how we can combat it may not just be uh, holding back from it, but centering ourselves and being uh, centered with respect to how does it feel for us. So may Allah allow us to en enable us to leave this Jum'ah better than we came to it, and allow us to leave every place better than we had entered it, Lord, accept this from us. Indeed, you are all hearing, all knowing. Our final prayer is that all praises are due to Allah, who is the Lord and sustainer and cherisher and nourisher of all of the world and all of creation. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.